is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Now, in the wake of 2016, many Africans had high hopes for what 2017 would hold. And while the news on the continent has not always been good, it has definitely been an eventful year. The continent has been witness to many things, both challenges and reinforcement of democracy, environmental disasters and successes, losses at the hand of terrorists and gains at the hands of security forces, as well as a roller coaster ride for many African economies. So what lessons did 2017 have to teach us? And what is going to grab the headlines next year? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, 2017 has seen some key changes across the African continent on all fronts, politically, economically, and socially, especially in terms of the ballot box. Let's take a quick look at some of the major events of the year. On the 22nd of January 2017, former Gambian President Yaya Jame went into exile after his surprising loss at the polls to the opposition, but only after the regional body ECOWAS threatened military intervention. Less than a month later, the Gambia formally swears in its new elected president, Adama Barrow, in front of a crowd of thousands, including many African heads of state, in what was seen as a turning point for the West African nation. And still in West Africa, later in the year, over 300 people were killed and more than 2,000 left homeless when heavy flooding hit Sierra Leone's capital, Freetown, on the 14th of August. On the 23rd of August, Angolans queued to vote without a president, Eduardo dos Santos, on the ballot for the first time since 1979. The ruling MPLA won the election, with Yao Lorenzo taking the reins as the new leader. Lorenzo went on to make many sweeping changes in the government and clamping down on corruption. On the 1st of September, in an unprecedented move, Kenya's Supreme Court declared the result of the August 8th presidential election invalid and ordered a rerun, throwing the country into a large period of uncertainty. But incumbent President Uhuru Kenyatta went on to win the October 26th repeat election and was sworn in in late November. Now, on the 16th of October, a devastating car bomb attack hit the Somali capital Mogadishu. The final death toll was reported to be 512 people, according to Abdullahi Mohamed Shirak, chairman of the Zubi Rescue Committee. Then, in one of the biggest moves of the year, Zimbabwe's President Robert Mugabe tendered his resignation on the 21st of November, dramatically bringing an end to his 37-year rule and sparking off jubilation celebrations in the nation's streets. Then, in the north of the continent, militants kill 305 at a Sufi mosque in Egypt on the 24th of November, leaving the country in shock and mourning. Officials have called it the deadliest terrorist attack in Egypt's modern history. Now, as we've just seen, it's been a year of both highs and lows in Africa. CGTN correspondents from around the continent went out into the streets to find out what the average African thought of the year, as well as their expectations for 2018. I believe that uh, 2018 might be better because 2017 we had a lot of problems. Uh, there were problems of fuel crisis, uh, there was uh, a little bit of issues in security as well. And uh, I believe maybe 2018 might be much better with the issue of uh, issue of peace uh, revitalization. I hope that my children and all youth get to learn jobs more easily. My sons and all graduates have been finding jobs difficult to come by. For the new year, I hope it will be better for all the youth. I wish for peace to prevail around the world next year. I hope Egypt becomes better than before. I don't want to see any more wars or fights in the world. I love Africa, great continent, more than a billion people. Africa has potential. So my prayer, actually to me it's more of a prayer, is that the African leaders will be who they are, that they will love our countries like they should. And if they do, it means that the economy of Africa will go higher. My prayer for Africa is that it will not be as dry as it has been this year, which means that agriculture should be better if the weather is better.
and now to offer their analysis of the past year on the continent. I have expert guests standing by in Johannesburg, Dr. Bob Wekes, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of the Witwatersrand, and with me in Nairobi, Professor Michael Shege. He is a professor of public policy and international development at the University of Nairobi. Thank right. you for joining us here on the uh, program. Dr. Wekes, I'll start off with you because 2016 was an economically challenging year for sub-Saharan Africa. Now, with that commodities decline and the drought in parts of the continent, 2017 was expected to be a better year. Overview, overall, what do you think 70, 2017 was like? What is your impression of 2017? Uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll imagine that uh, 2017 was by far a better year than 2016 in my assessment. But I think that uh, in some respects, we retrogressed as a continent on uh, certain aspects. Uh, but if you look at uh, indices, for example, uh, matters to do with uh, terrorism, you find that actually there was a drop in the level of uh, terrorist attacks in places such as Nigeria, Kenya, and, uh, and, and other places. Uh, but again, on the other hand, uh, one can actually say it's, it was a mixed bag because if you look on the other hand, uh, matters to do with the immigration of Africans looking for better or greener pastures in uh, Europe and uh, the West, that actually increased rather than uh, subsided compared to 2016. On the, on the resource and natural resources um, end of things, uh, it looks like Africa was starting to pick up again from a huge slump. 2015-2016. So on that front, you begin to see countries kind of regaining in a very cautious way their economic foothold. So I would say it, uh, it was a mixed bag of uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly in terms of uh, uh, you know the fortunes of the continent. Right. We'll get to the specifics of the good, the bad, and the ugly in a minute. But mm -hmm. Professor Shege, your overall impression of 20, 2017? I think the year 2017 will be remembered above all by one story, by the reason of one story. And that is the slave trade story that has been internationally portrayed uh, in Libya. And that was the single most important subject when African leaders met with European Union leaders this year. By way of publicity, what it shows is that we have a tragedy of monumental proportions among young people looking for good alternatives in the outside world and doing it in the wrong way. And this is despite a country, as Bob has just said, or a set of countries where the economies are generally improving. And yet, we have a lot of young people, young employment, who are looking for opportunities outside the continent. We have to do something about youth unemployment. And that is a problem we have had year after year. But if, if you talk, though, of uh, economies improving mm -hmm. and yet people are still uh, looking for jobs outside of the country, young yeah. people are still flowing outside of the country, as we saw with the Libyan migrations there, yeah. what do you think, what has been the issue? What is it that is stopping African countries yeah. from taking advantage of the growing economies by not uh, providing the employment? The tragedy of Africa, between countries which are doing very well, like Mauritius, uh, Seychelles and others, and those Botswana and others who are not doing badly, is that we have a serious problem of what the African Development Bank a few years ago called jobless growth. We are having economies which are developing, which are expanding, but the kind of jobs they are creating are low in quality, that is they are busy in formal sector, temporary, and not quite what the young people come out of schools expect. This is the conundrum in our African economic growth in 2017 and in the past 10 years or so, which we have not been able to solve. Economics expand, you get youth coming out of school in the millions, but no capacity to hire them for quality jobs. Right, uh, Dr. Wakesa, to get your thoughts here though, in terms of the views of the issues that impacted the continent uh, most in 2017, what would you say those were that made such an impact on the continent? I think the, the, for me the most dramatic uh, development of 2017 will be the elections. I think uh, the continent seems to be entering a phase where elections become the theater of uh, lots of drama and sometimes uh, very negative developments. And, but, but on the whole, some kind of progress towards respect for elections and so forth. If you just look at it, in um, December 2016, we had elections in the Gambia where Yaya Jameh, 
the strongman there who had ruled for over 20 years attempted not to leave power and you know the Senegalese and Nigerian army kind of stepped in and then he, fl he fled to Equatorial Guinea. Then we, we followed that with the elections in Somalia which shocked people by being uh, fairly you know by Somalian standards uh, fairly straightforward and so forth. Then we have had drama in the Kenyan elections. I think the drama almost sti still continues. Uh, and and, and um, then we had the change of power in Angola, you know, from uh, long-serving uh, Eduardo Dos Santos to the current leader, uh, Joao uh, Lorengo. And, and, and so in all these elections, you actually see an attempt to sustain the democratic move for re respect of the ballot. We, we cannot even forget um, the Rwandan case where President Kagame actually garnered 98% of the vote. So I think for me, one of the underlying governance issue that touches on matters economic, social, cultural, and so forth is the whole issue of elections, which was very dramatic in 2017. Right, uh, Dr. Mokesa, I'll just continue on that thought because uh, two of the countries that had some of the longest serving presidents, uh, uh, obviously Zimbabwe and Angola, the presidents there uh, resigned or were in transition to other uh, uh, to another president what messages are these events though sending to the world because liberia as well the supreme court held the you know put on hold the rerun what are these events saying about the state of electoral democracy in africa or africa's evolution no no i i think some people might actually have a, a negative or pessimistic view of uh, elections generally on the continent in particular so uh, those who take an extra or ultra liberal approach uh, or view to issues, but on the whole, we are seeing the you know uh, demise or the moving on transition of power. You know, handing over of power from w one pair of hands to the other, as happened in Angola, Zimbabwe. Even though the the, the, the circumstances under, under which um, uh, Robert Gabriel Mugabe left were very dramatic. But uh, it's still a handover of power, you know, it's a still a form of transition. So on the whole, I think on that uh, front alone, much as there's uh, lots of um, uh, legal issues and challenges to elections, as we saw in Kenya, as we saw in, in uh, Liberia, where there was the runoff on uh, December 26th, it's a demonstration that actually elections are beginning to take shape as a means of transition of power. Now, it's not an easy... Uh, process, right. given uh, the history of uh, the African continent as, uh, as we do with the elections, but um, on the whole, one will say actually we are progressing rather than retrogressing. Of mm -hmm. course, there are places where there are attempts for leaders to seek third terms and so forth, but uh, on the whole, I think we are on the move. Right. Uh, do you share that uh, optimism that uh, on the whole, the continent is progressing when it comes to uh, electoral democracy or Africa's politics? I, I share uh, Dr. Wakesa's uh, assessment. I think the good things that are happening in African democracies tend to be less highlighted by the global media than the tragic cases. Congo, uh, Central African Republic, Somalia, Southern Sudan. We forget the good things that happened. Bob is talking about West Africa. ECOWAS, if compared to East Africa and Southern Africa, has shown that it is not willing to tolerate illegal seizure of power, and they want, they will intervene militarily if they have to, as they did in the Gambia, in uh, Blaise Campaore, in um, uh, Burkina Faso, and tentatively also in Togoland. Now, what is like in Togo? What is likely to happen is that we forget what has happened in what happened in Nigeria in 2015 was a good thing. We are going to see changes that are going to be positive, as everybody has said in this program, in Zimbabwe and also in Angola. The tra intractable cases are those where it is not just democracy, but political stability. The case of Kenya is one where we have democracy on the move. But it's a democracy that excludes critical segments of the population. If Kenyans want to advance their democracy, and I believe they will do that, right. they have to redesign the constitution so that it's more expansive and more inclusive. And I've always said they should go towards proportional representation so that parties are represented in government in proportions that reflect the votes they got. Right, uh, Professor Shege and uh, Dr. Wekesa, we leave it there for the moment. We are going to take a short break now, but when we come back, we'll have more insights into how Africa fared 
in 2017. Do stay with us. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. We continue our analysis of Africa in 2017. I still have my expert guest standing by in Johannesburg, Dr. Bob Wekesa, postdoctoral fellow, University of Witzvorchtsrand, and with me here in a room, Professor Michael Schegger. Professor, the risk factors that Africa faced in 2017, uh, Dr. Wekesa there did mention that security was still uh, an issue despite the fact that not at a larger scale as we saw in 2016. What were some of the risk factors that we saw on the African continent in 2017? Uh, terrorism, as uh, Bob uh, Wekes has just mentioned, is still present, though marginally declining. The major risk factor we still continue to face on this continent is food insecurity. And the vulnerability of Africa's economies to drought and insufficient rains. You saw this in the Sahel once again. You saw it in uh, Sudan, southern Sudan, although that is part of the political instability there. Serious problem in the Horn of Africa coming into Kenya. These economies are affected not just by the drought, but by the fact that agricultural productivity, trade, which all these go together, because these are predominantly agricultural economies. We still haven't come to a sensible solution of how to deal with food insecurity. At some point, you've seen all of the debate, Gates Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, all of these are getting into this. African governments have to weigh in seriously and decide what we need to do about insecurity in that sense. When it comes to uh, food security and when it comes to droughts, though, Africa is having much longer drought seasons and, exactly. and recurrent droughts now mm -hmm. in the last couple of years. How is it that governments are still unable to come to grips with that? A lot of what is happening is something beyond Africa's control, unfortunately. Climate change prolonged periods of drought. Rains, when they come, tend to be exceptionally heavy and lead to floods. This oscillation of weather patterns and the fact that we are told the African sea levels will be rising faster in the tropics than in other parts of the world. So we are experiencing a vulnerability and a destruction of our economies through raw reasons of our own. We have to weigh in more seriously, though, when it comes to the climate change pacts that was agreed in Paris. It is sad the United States had decided under Trump to stay out of this. Right. But still, I don't think we are doing enough as Africans to demand uh, cooperation with the European Union and other African, uh, European countries who are willing to help to mitigate the circumstances of climate change. I see a little of this happening in Kenya. I'm not seeing across Africa a widely agreed climate mitigation strategy. That's unfortunate. Right. Uh, Dr. Wakesa, your view on uh, Africa's risk, risk factors in 2017? No, I, I largely concur with uh, Prof. Uh, Inochege on uh, his sentiments uh, regarding um, where we are in terms of uh, environment as a security issue. Uh, you know, climate change as um, a major cause for drought and which then therefore leads to uh, any number of um, uh, security challenges, including the hyper levels of uh, immigration. I think, in, in, in my opinion, one of the things that um, we must recognize is that uh, Africa is not really the biggest uh, pollutant. Uh, it doesn't, African, you know, countries do not uh, have two large industries that affect the ozone layer and so forth. And at the 2015 Paris uh, Climate uh, Pact, it was agreed that a fund of 100 billion US dollars will be set aside to actually help out countries uh, on the African continent right. to actually cope with uh, extreme uh, weather and, cli and climate climatic events. But as you might have realized, uh, it is in 2017 that uh, President Donald Trump actually decided to walk away from uh, the, the climate, uh, you know, Pact that uh, you know the Paris Agreement, which actually puts uh, Africa in a dire and precarious situation. 
So uh, uh, going forward, I think uh, one of the multilateral diplomatic engagements that the African leaders and government might want to engage in, and indeed, uh, uh, you know, climate um, and environmental activists might want to engage in, is actually to see how they can work with countries that are interested in Africa's climate, like China, for example, and try and bring back the U.S. to the negotiating table um, so that we can uh, arrest these um, environment-related security issues. Uh, but however, as I, as I did mention earlier and as the uh, prof has uh, confirmed, in terms of uh, terrorist attacks and so forth, it is still, uh, you know, these, uh, the, the attacks are still at a very unacceptably high levels. But that's not to recognize the fact that they're actually dropping. And right. uh, sometimes we need to get our figures right, not to say uh, on the basis of one incident we say, you know, in Mogadishu, for example, we say terrorist acts are still on the rise. Actually, they are dropping, and we need to maintain that tempo to actually bring them uh, down to levels that are manageable or at least even obliterate uh, the, the, the scourge of uh, terrorism uh, entirely. Yeah. Professor Shege, let me get your thoughts here, because in terms of China and Africa partnerships, though, yes. in 2017, we did see uh, quite a lot more infrastructural activity. Yeah. In terms of uh, China and Africa's partnership, what is your overall assessment for 2017? I think... China will become even more involved in African development than before because they want to become more involved with African development, particularly in infrastructure. Uh, you're reading now about more investment in railways and roads and bridges in Nigeria, the largest continent, the country in the continent. In Kenya, they're expanding the standard gauge rail to Kisumu and on to Uganda and uh, Rwanda. So they will be more involved in the pattern that China has set for itself in Africa. It's not just infrastructure, but also, and not quite aid, because they, they say they're not in the aid business. It's trade. You get infrastructure, you get uh, credit from the Exim Bank in China, and a combination of grants and whatever, and then you proceed with this. Nobody else is in, as involved in the development and construction of infrastructure in Africa as China is at the moment, and will continue to be. However, it's good for competition because you see Americans also coming in and edging in. We're going to have a uh, superhighway linking Mombasa to Nairobi, constructed by Bechel, the American uh, construction company, right. which is financed by the U.S. Exim Bank, the exact model that the Chinese are using. So they will be more involved, and the EU are also concerned to intervene and more. The World Bank is changing its mode so that it can get more involved in infrastructure. So it's a good thing for Africa with China taking the lead. All right. Uh, Bob, because I, I do want to get your views, though, uh, in terms of China-Africa partnership, because um, South Africa will be hosting the BRICS Summit next year. In terms of China-Africa partnerships of 2017 overall, how did the relations fare? I think the relationship uh, has, gone, has reached a point where it's almost like uh, there's no reverse gear. As uh, some uh, people use, you know, some uh, colorful phrase, they say, the relations are proceeding as if there's no brake on the vehicle. It's, uh, you know, cascading forward. And I think it's, uh, on the whole, a good thing. Uh, we saw, you know, you know the initially when we had um, this talk of uh, new normal economics in China and the recalibration of the economic model and approach in China, we thought that uh, the Chinese uh, will uh, turn their back to Africa. But actually, it's just this year that we saw President Uhuru Kenyatta and the Prime Minister of Ethiopia going to Beijing, I think about May, to be participate in the Maritime uh, Silk Road uh, you know, um, you know, conference, we, which is a, a huge geopolitical uh, mechanism in which Africa, and particularly countries on the eastern seaboard of uh, the continent, you know, stand to gain. Already, there's already an indication that um, the Silk Road Fund is going to benefit African countries in an immense way and, uh, you know, kind of help along with the Africa Union agenda of uh, cross-border trade by increasing, you know, cross-border infrastructure. I mean, we have uh, some uh, very interesting, very well uh, written, very well thought out uh, infrastructure plans for the integration of the African continent, but we have never really moved because of lack of funds. And I think this, th this year alone, the number of uh, roads and railways and, and seaports that China has been involved in kind of starts to take us towards the dream that uh, African leaders have had uh, 
of uh, African integration has actually stated out in the Agenda 2063. Actually, one of the better developments of the 2015 FOCAC that happened here in Johannesburg right. was the, uh, the, the co-option of the, Afri uh, the, the African Union Commission as uh, part of the FOCAC mechanism. Because initially, the African Union Commission was actually kind of an observer. And therefore, this year, the number of projects, particularly in infrastructure, that China has rolled out on the African continent kind of uh, takes it to the level where we are thinking continentally, we are thinking at a pan-African level as far as uh, infrastructure projects and therefore integration of the conti continent is, uh, is, is concerned. So right. I'm actually bullish about the possibility of this actually going forward in a, in a, in a very steady manner uh, next year being uh, you know, the year when we'll have the seventh uh, FOCAC um, uh, you know, conference in Beijing. Right, uh, and I'm just going to get a very brief winding comment from you. Professor Shege, looking back at 2017, would you say Africa is exiting 2017 or a, on a high or on a low? It's a, exiting on a, on a high, I think, on the economy, particularly because we've survived a very difficult patch of declining commodity prices. This seems to have stabilized. There are questions ri rising about debt in countries like Kenya and, and Cote d'Ivoire and those governments ought to pay attention to that. I am very pessimistic and feel bad about 2017, about the real tragic spots in this country, in this continent. Kasai, we are being told in Congo, DRC, about 200,000 people died in a continuing ethnic warfare that is going to, Somalia still, uh, Southern Sudan, the tragedy continues. There are about a quarter of a million refugees coming into Uganda and it's a humanitarian tragedy, and the Central African Republic. We have, as Africans, got to be conscious about our image of the world. We don't want a world where every evening they talk and they, they switch on their news even. It's those tragedies that come forward. In addition to that, the, that one in Libya on slave trade that I mentioned before, our leaders at the AU, individually and regionally, have to pay attention to these tragedies, tragedies in 2018. Right. Uh, Dr. Wekesa, very briefly though, is Africa exiting 2017 on a high or on a low? I think on the high, uh, I am by nature an optimist, um, and, and particularly, uh, you know, an Afro-optimist. You know, in, the, the, the continent has uh, made some strides. In fact, one of the biggest uh, achievements, in my opinion, is to see that uh, leaders such, such as Eduardo Dos Santos and uh, Mugabe have actually exited the stage without bloodshed in uh, very important countries such as Angola and Zimbabwe. So I, I think we, we are closing the year on a high. Right, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for your insights, and that's all we have time for this week. But thank you to my guests for their insights. In Johannesburg, Dr. Bob Wekesa, postdoctoral fellow at the University of the Witz Watersrand, and with me in Nairobi, Professor Michael Shege, Professor of Public Policy and International Development at the University of Nairobi. Well, do remember you can join the conversation online through Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. And do join us again next week when we look ahead at what's in store for Africa in 2018. From me, Beatrice Marshall. Goodbye.